This last of the pulmonary lessons is on ENT pathologies. This is going to feel like a hodgepodge because it is. We're going to cover the common infections of the ear, nose, and throat, that is the upper airway. From the perspective of the epithelium, as opposed to what we did in microbiology, which was the same thing, only from the perspective of the organisms. And we're going to talk about structural problems, like malignancies and some embryonic stuff. So it does feel like a little bit of a hodgepodge, but that's because most of these conditions are more of a nuisance than dangerous, but they're common, so you have to be able to recognize them. By the end, I want you to identify some of the key clinical features that will tell you what the diagnosis is, whether it's pharyngitis, peritonsal abscess, or a retropharyngeal abscess. Once you have the diagnosis, you can then branch off to find what type of epithelium is it, because the gut tube is always going to be non-keratinized squamous cell, and everything else, all the appendages, are respiratory. And so when you make the diagnosis, you know the epithelium, you know the infectious agents. That's what I want you to get by the end of this, and then some cancers. All right, let's first start off with the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses. These structures are appendages to the gut tube, and so they are therefore respiratory epithelium. When we encountered infections of the respiratory epithelium in the lower airway infections, the pneumonia, we said that strep pneumo was the most common, then Haemophilus, then Moraxella. Isn't that convenient? Any time you have a respiratory epithelium, it's the same organism, strep pneumo, Haemophilus, Moraxella. So all of these are gonna be color-coded green because they're gonna be respiratory epithelium, and if you make one of these diagnoses, you know that it's either a virus or these bacteria. The first infection of the nasal cavity and sinus is called viral, because most of the infections are viral. Rhino, nasal cavity, sinusitis, inflammation of the sinuses. Viral rhino sinusitis is by far more common than bacterial sinusitis. Viral Rhino sinusitis is a very complicated way of saying the cold. Caused by adenovirus, rhinovirus, and sometimes coronavirus. Those viruses which grow better at lower than body temperature, so cannot infect the low respiratory tract. These guys are gonna cause the common cold. And the common cold, if you may have had it once, presents with a clear rhinorrhea. And while there may be viral symptoms, aches, malaise, there's usually no accompanying fever. If the sinuses are involved, there may be a sinus pressure but there won't be, it is without, pain or tenderness. These self-resolve and need no intervention. The thing is that when you get inflammation of the respiratory epithelium, virus invades the cells, CD8 cells come in response, the tissue gets edematous, the lumen narrows, and it's the narrowing of the lumen that predisposes to bacterial infection, especially at the drainage of the meatuses. The sinuses can't drain because the respiratory epithelium lining those structures is inflamed and it's closing off the lumen. That sets up obstruction. Anytime you obstruct anything that's hollow, it's a nidus for infection. And so the inflamed mucosa that normally goes back to normal with no sequela can lead to and is usually how bacterial sinusitis comes about.
bacterial sinusitis, inflammation, and infection of the respiratory epithelium, strep pneuma, haemophilus, morexella. Almost always following an antecedent viral infection, the patient improves as the virus goes away, but then it switches. Instead of a clear rhinorrhea, there's going to be a purulent, thick, white discharge. Instead of viral symptoms, there's going to be a fever. Instead of pressure, there's going to be pain. And there will be tenderness over whichever sinus is infected. And usually, this is the, the most commonly affected is the maxillary sinus. And the reason for that is the maxillary sinus drains up in organisms who are upright. If we're on all fours, it would make sense, but since we stand upright, the lowest sinus has to drain up to the middle meatus, which means that it's difficult for it to drain most of the time as you're walking around. Bacterial sinusitis is treated with beta-lactams to get strep pneumo, haemophilus, and morexella. Now, if you have the viral rhinosinusitis picture, but no viral symptoms, and it happens to you all the time, that sounds like allergic rhinitis. It's going to be the clear rhinorrhea without the viral symptoms, without fever, without pressure. Allergic rhinitis is a type one hypersensitivity reaction, which means IgE, mast cells, and eosinophils. Sounds a lot like asthma, and indeed, it is often found with the A's. Asthma, allergies, and A to B. Kids get this problem, and, you, and if they have recurrent bouts of allergic rhinitis, being exposed to, a poly, to an allergen, and then getting clear rhinorrhea without fever, they may end up with nasal polyps. And nasal polyps are a physical exam finding that essentially say, this kid's probably got asthma allergies and A to B. And changing gears for a moment, we leave the inflammation of the mucosa and come to an embryonic structural defect. Coanal atresia. A coana is the space where the nasal cavity gives way to the nasopharynx. That transition is from respiratory epithelium to non-keratinized squamous epithelium. Because the airway in the appendages are appendages of the gut tube, all of these structures form by overproliferation and recanalization. If that transition doesn't recanalize the right way, there's going to be an obstruction to airflow from the nose to the nasopharynx. Now, an adult form can occur if there's only unilateral. It was there all along, but the patient didn't know about it until later. But the way it's going to present for your exam is it going to be bilateral atresia. And since it's bilateral, baby can't breathe through his nose. So this is going to be the neonatal form. And what you're looking for is a baby who gets blue while feeding because no air can flow into the respiratory tract because his mouth is busy doing something else, and pink when crying. Because when a baby cries, it uses its mouth to bring air in and out. Simply inspecting with the camera would be enough to make the diagnosis. There's a membrane. Often it's easy to perforate unless there's bone in it, in which case it needs to be resected. This is the nasal and sinuses. We're going to move over and move down into, deeper into the airway, nasopharynx, oropharynx. The nasopharynx and oropharynx are the non-keratinized stratified squamous cell epithelium and not strep pneumo haemophilus morexella, that's the respiratory epithelium, this gets infected by group A strep biogenes and staph aureus. 
you have to be careful because it's not strep and strep, right? Oropharynx, nasopharynx, group A strep pyogenes, respiratory epithelium, strep pneumo. The first infection is pharyngitis. Like the sinusitis, pharyngitis is most often caused by viruses. Adeno, rhino, corona. But I'm going to continue this discussion because as it progresses from pharyngitis down to the abscesses, it becomes more bacterial. So well, I'm not going to write these viruses again because you can see them and I want you to stay focused on bacteria as we move down the list. Viral causes are by far more common, but the big deal is strep. Because if it is a group A strep pyogenes pharyngitis, a potential sequela is both post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis and rheumatic heart disease. You don't want to give antibiotics to a viral infection, but you definitely don't want to miss a strep infection that does need antibiotics, again, beta-lactams. Pharyngitis presents with painful swallowing and an erythematous oropharynx. There may be swelling of the tonsils, but you look in the throat and it's red. And so the patient is going to complain of razor blades whenever they swallow. That's a dinophagia. That may radiate up the ears. The big deal, though, is, is this bacterial or not? And so you do not have to calculate the centaur criteria, but you should know what they are. It's named after an individual, and I have taken it and used it as the mnemonic to cover the things that are in it. It is the absence of a cough, and then the presence of an exudate, cervical lymphadenopathy, temperature greater than 100.4, 38C, and then the or is because if you're less than 13, you get an extra point. If you're greater than or equal to 45, you lose a point. And again, I don't want you learning what the points mean. It's going to help determine what you actually do with the patient in front of you, whether you just give them antibiotics, whether you swab or culture them, or whether you say it's viral, go on your way. You won't have to calculate it, because if your exam wants to telegraph that this is viral, they will give you none of this. If they want to telegraph that it is bacterial and you need to antibios, they'll give you all of this. Absence of a cough, presence of exudate nodes, and a fever indicate that this is a bacterial pharyngitis and you do need to treat beta-lactams. Progressing through the bacterial severity, you can get a peritonsillar abscess. Now this is definitely going to be bacterial because it's squamous cell, group A, strep pyogenes, staph aureus. Peritonsal abscess is going to present with a pharyngitis. It's a pharyngitis plus is more severe. It's going to occur in individuals who are four to seven years old, and they'll present with drooling because it hurts so much to swallow. These patients will have a high fever, and they'll speak with a muffled or it's called a hot potato voice. In addition to seeing an inflamed erythematous oropharynx, you may actually see the peritonsillar, off to the side, abscess mass. But if you don't actually see the abscess itself, what you'll see is it pushing all the structures over, uvula deviation. This does need antibiotics and drainage, but it is not nearly as severe as the most severe bacterial infection which is retropharyngeal abscess. Pharyngitis plus plus. It's going to be four to seven years old. They're going to be drooling. Have a high fever. Hot potato voice. But instead of uvular deviation, the patient is going to present with their neck flexed, 
and anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. It's a retropharyngeal abscess in the back of their throat. If they extend their neck, it brings the back closer and it touches the structures up front, which hurts.